Hallelujah. 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 You guys have touched my heart. Pastor Mona, I am speechless. I'm so humbled by your gracious words. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Pastor Matt, Pastor Mona, for the gracious invitation. Thank you, Jubilee, for having me. Worship team, guys, you just rocked the house for Jesus. Man, I, can, I was ready to just keep going. Amen. Woohoo! Keep, keep doing what you do. Heaven rejoices with you. Oof. I can't tell you the spirit of excellence in this church. I am so blessed. Good job. Well done, guys. Well done. Wow. Well, I am Guy 3. Everyone say Guy. Now say 3. So you're going to slide from one to the other just over a soft A. Guy 3. One more time. Guy 3. You know who I am, but you can call me Guy. No one except my parents actually call me Guy 3. Everyone else just calls me Guy or Pastor Guy. Um, before we start, I just want to tell you something. So there was this guy, a, a very good man, and he just wanted to live better. And so he went to his doctor and he said, look, I just, you know, I don't know what the secret of life is. I don't know what the meaning of life is, but I just want to live well. You know, so I want to, I want to live long. I want to live victoriously. Like, what do I have to do? You know, especially this long life. I want a long life here on earth. So the doctor said, well, you know, um, you, you got to watch what you eat and, you know, don't drink and don't smoke and stay away from the drug stuff. And, you know, you're happily married. Just love her. Don't let your eyes wander all over the place. You don't, you don't need to be a woman. And so the man's thinking, going, okay, this is good. This is good. I can, I can do this. And then he starts, the guy keeps going, you know, well, the internet is not a great place, so stay off the internet. And, you know, who needs a movie? Don't, don't go to those places. Don't watch Netflix. What's that? No, sin. Come on. Stay away from all of that. And, you know, Think about it. You don't even need technology. So get rid of the, the, the computer in your house and you don't need the iPad. And so the guy's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, doc, doc. Is this really going to give me a long life? The doctor said, well, you know, I don't know. I can't guarantee you that. But I will guarantee that your life will seem long <laughs> when you have none of these things. <laughs> See, we all want something, don't we? We all want a happy, long life. I know I do. I want a victorious life. I want a, I want a joyful life. I want, a, I want an impactful life, influential life. But I have been doing this long enough to know that Christians are some of the most beat up people I know. We struggle, just like the world. We sin, just like the world. Victorious? <laughs> What's that? I can't even make it, and I haven't even got out of bed yet. What's going on? What's going on with the body of Christ? Why is life so hard. And today, I want to talk to you about something that I truly believe in my heart of hearts is the key to victorious living. And I'm going to give it to you in one word. It's this. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, the Old Testament mentions it about, I don't know, some 45 times, and the New Testament mentions it's, it's some 35 times. Our Lord and Savior Jesus talked about it many times. So it's not something that comes as a shock to us. We know, we know things like, for example, Matthew 5, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. We know this. We've read this many times, some of us. Some of us know it by heart. Matthew 6, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, oof, ouch, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. I don't know, but that should make some of us quake in our boots. If you're wearing it in your shoes, in your sandals, whatever, any, any kind of shoes, you should be scared, right? And yet, we struggle with this. You know why we struggle? I'm convinced we struggle because we don't know what forgiveness really looks like. We want to know. We read Paul's letters in the New Testament. In Colossians, he says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and here's that word, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. 
I want to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? Jesus would forgive. Oh, well, I can't do that. I want to be like Jesus in all the other aspects, not that one. Ephesians, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Here's that word again, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Wow. It's not just that Jesus talked about it. It's not that Paul talked about it. Forgiveness is the bedrock of our salvation. Think about this. While we, me, you, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians calls us, get this, the enemy of God. We were not even on the same side. We were not even on the fence. We were on the other side. We were enemies of God when he did what he did. Man, that's something. How in the world can I be the recipient of that kind of forgiveness and yet have such a hard time walking in it? Okay, you know why? Because there's two extremes. On the one extreme, you've got people that say, well, you know what? I'm not really angry. I'm a very happy person. I just, I don't think about these things. I don't have unforgiveness. If you're sitting here and you've thought that, we'll just pray for the spirit of lying (laughs) that's hanging over you because it's way more pathological, psychological than you could possibly imagine. It sits under the many layers inside your soul. And then there's the other extreme. You don't know what he did to me. You don't know how he hurt me. And there was nobody there to rescue me. You don't know the tears that I've cried. You don't know the bed-soaked sheets that I've had to wash in the morning. You just can't imagine. And you know what, sister? You know what, brother? I can't imagine. I am sorry for the pain that you've experienced. But I have to humbly and kindly tell you, that's the other extreme, because Jesus was very, very, very clear when he said, if you don't fix it with your brother and your sister, and you want to come over here and do something at my altar, I can't receive your worship. I can't accept your praise. Wow. Now, that sounds a little serious. This isn't like those numbers that you see on the road suggesting speed limit. We all know that's just a general suggestion, right? (laughs) Because who obeys that? But this is an actual command out of the mouth of our master. You know why we don't forgive? It's because we think this is what forgiveness is. So first, I want to just give you some context, and I want to bust some myths. First of all, this is what forgiveness is not. So let's go. Let's go to that slide. A few slides down. There we go. All right. First of all, forgiveness is not approving incorrect behavior. Remember that prostitute that Jesus forgave? He said, go no more. I mean, go and sin no more. Right. Go. Go. You're released. He forgave her, but he didn't approve what she did. So it's not approval. Two, it's not excusing someone's unkind words or deeds against you. That's not what we're doing. Hey, it's not saying, go ahead. You can go ahead and speak unkindly to me. No, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is begging God on their behalf. Lord, they did me wrong, but don't hold it against them. Wow, that's forgiveness. It's not justifying someone's wrong. Hey, if it's wrong, here's Revelation. It's wrong. (laughs) right? If it's wrong, it's wrong. You don't go and make a wrong a right. That's not what forgiveness is. It's not pardoning someone's choices. We all know actions have consequences. Words have consequences, okay? You, you, sticks and stones may not break my bones, but unkind words will hurt my soul. It'll hurt your soul. They have consequences. It's not letting a person off the hook. A person's got to face the consequences. That's not what forgiveness is. It's not demanding full reconciliation. Guess what? If you have something against somebody else or they have something against you, there's two parties here. There's no way you can force someone to say sorry or to make up with you. Reconciliation may or may not be possible. Forgiveness, true biblical forgiveness, does not require it. You can forgive and still not be reconciled. Denying what happened. Now, this happens in extreme abuse cases. We know this. We've read about it. We've talked about it. Suppression, repression, right? Don't want to think about it. It never really happened. It wasn't that bad anyway. I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you, 
It's not about closing your eyes and pretending that someone did not harm you. You gotta face it and you gotta own it. Because if you don't own it, you'll never be free from it, right? It's not about forgetting or turning a blind eye. In fact, this is dangerous. Any psychologist will tell you the best way to process something is to live out and speak about every excruciating detail. In other words, don't sweep it under a rug. Process it. You won't forget it. So this forget and forgive, no, that's not possible. God does not forget our sins. He simply removes them as the East is from the West. He doesn't consider it anymore. It's an act of choice. It's an act of will. He chooses not to hold your sin and my sin against us anymore. It's a choice. We won't forget. We can't turn a blind eye. We got to process it so that the sting is removed. We cannot pretend that we are not hurt. Now, that's not what forgiveness is. Hey, if you're hurt, and I know a lot of us here have been hurt, go ahead and cry. Weep. Grieve. Shout, vent with a trusted friend. Do what you need to, and then let it go. Own it, and then give it to him. So this is what forgiveness is not. And you know how I know that this is what forgiveness is not? Because for a very long time in my life, I thought this is what forgiveness was. Here's my story. You heard a little bit in the video clip. I was born and raised a Hindu Brahmin, India's highest Orthodox caste when the Aryans came from the Middle East and settled in the Indo Valley um, civilization in northern India, they structured their society in different ways. And at the very top were the priests. They were the advisors to the kings. They were the ones that performed the rituals. They were the mediators between mankind and God. And if any of this is kind of bringing things from Leviticus to your mind, you're on the right track. In fact, both my grandfathers were priests and my grandfather on my father's side was a high priest in a temple. This was the family and culture and heritage into which I was born. My father was initiated but decided to go to school, so he never became a priest. He became a certified accountant. And when I was still a little baby, he left to go to Zambia in Africa, and that's where I was raised. Africa is in my blood. Yes, hallelujah, that's my home. But it didn't matter that we were so far away from their temples and traditions. My parents still belonged to a Brahmin community in Zambia. In fact, the temple, the Hindu temple, they would call my dad once in a while to come and do rituals on their behalf if the priest wasn't available because he was ordained and he could, so he performed, and this is how I was raised. But I always had this funny bent. I always asked too many questions. Why do we do that? What does that really mean? And if someone told me not to do it because psh, that's not allowed, I'd do it just to see if I would be struck from heaven. And I never really got struck from heaven. And so I would question, what is this? Like, why do we do what we do? All these gods that we try to reach, and yet, do any of them hear our prayers? Do they help? Do they respond? Can I interact with them? I remember sitting in a class, a, a, a religious class, and our regular teacher had gone to India for a season. And so this other lady stepped in to take our class for just a few weeks. And it was very interesting because she said, we're going to do something different today. I'm going to teach you something that's not from the Hindu Vedas. And I said, oh, wow, this, this should be interesting. You want to know what she taught us that day? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I remember going home that day going, Father? Who's father? That's not a term I've ever heard before. And hey, get this, we prayed in English. I could actually understand what was being said. Thy kingdom come, that sounds kind of cool. What kingdom? Thy will be done, I got that. God can do anything he wants to do, he's God. That's what I was taught, okay. On earth as it is in heaven. You, you mean I can experience a little bit of that here? How? I now had more questions than I ever had in my life before. Right after I graduated from college, I started making some stupid decisions because I didn't know then what I know now. Here's revelation. If you are in your, in your early 20s, teens or early 20s, guess what? You don't know everything there is to know. I know that now. I didn't then. So I made some stupid decisions, got myself in a relationship that I had no business getting myself into because I was chasing something. I just wanted to prove to my community, you are wrong. 
you don't know what you're doing, but I went about it all the wrong way. And I caused a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Now, somewhere in the middle of all this hurt and pain, my brother, who'd had a really hard time when we moved from Zambia to Canada, got stuck with the wrong crowd. He started doing drugs, he started selling drugs, he started selling all kinds of other stuff that we don't know where he got. So it was just really bad, got caught a few times. But every time, every single time he got caught, God would send somebody. I mean, one time a police officer said, listen, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I should be writing you up and calling your parents. But if you sit down and give me 10 minutes, I won't put anything on your record. He said, okay, what do you want for 10 minutes? He said, I'm going to say something. You got to listen. I want to talk to you about Jesus. So this kept happening to him again and again and again until one night when his gang was somewhere downtown Toronto outside a, a club. He was sitting in the car of a Muslim friend who had accepted Jesus. And he heard the gospel and he received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, if you thought things were horrible in our house when he was on drugs, things got really, really bad after he became a Christian. Because overnight, he didn't smell so no more. Overnight, he was polite. All the cussing stopped. Just a very kind young man, and it drove my parents crazy. My dad stopped him one Sunday and said, where are you going in your suit? What are you doing? And so he said, you want to know? Come with me. And he wouldn't come, but he kept needling and pushing. Going, I want to know what you're doing. And so he found out. He followed him one day and found out that he was going to church. Why in the world would you, a Hindu Brahmin boy, be going to that place? And he said, because I know God. I found God. I know who he is. And so started a big war in our house. They couldn't be in the same room without clawing each other out. It was horrible. And it was during this time that I was going through my mess. And I remember my brother coming so many times to say, look, guy, can I just show you something? Can you just, just, just read this? And I remember just pulling it out of his hand and said, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that nonsense. I don't believe in that garbage. Don't come give it to me. Don't you know who I am? We're Brahmins. I don't want that. God has a great sense of humor. Today, I'm a servant of his word. <laughs> Don't you all give up. Well, one night, I was at the end of my rope, and I was ready to end my life. And my brother called. He said, hi, what, what you doing? Nothing. And he heard it in my voice. And just like that, he said, Guy, come with me tomorrow. It was a Saturday evening. He said, come with me tomorrow. I said, where? He said, you know where? Church. And I said, you know I don't believe in that. He's like, I don't care. I didn't ask if you believed. I said, come. I said, well, what do I got to do? Come light candles? Because that's all I thought you did. You know? <laughs> Church, somebody goes and you light a bunch of candles. You know, that's all you do. He was like, you don't have to do anything. And I said, wait, are they going to make me do that thing? Like, you know, like. And he said, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to light the candle. And he was like, do I have to kneel? You don't have to do anything, God. Just come with me. And I said, why? Because he said, my God will make everything okay. And I lost my temper. I said, my God? Isn't God just God? And he answered, not my God. And so I went, not knowing what to expect. And that very first Sunday, I hadn't even entered the sanctuary. I was somewhere in the parking lot. I remember getting out of that car just thinking, oh my goodness, someone is here. There was just a presence that followed me right from the parking lot right into the sanctuary. I can't tell you what that pastor preached. I don't have a clue. Didn't have a Bible. I kept waiting for the candles to pop out. They never came out. <laughs> All I know is there was an invitation given, and by this time, there were tears down my face. And I knew someone was just pushing, nudging my shoulder. My brother was nowhere near me. He told me later, I just could not sit there. I got up pacing up and down in the back, praying in the Holy Ghost because there's nothing else that he could do. Because he said, if you didn't get up and go, I was going to pull you up and take you to the front. So I just got myself up and went. So there was no one beside me, but I felt a nudge. And I responded, and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But if I thought it was bad when, when my brother accepted the Lord, it got really bad when I accepted the Lord, because the whole community was involved now. Who does she think she is? Doesn't she know who we are? We're Brahmins. We don't do that stuff. Who goes to a church? Nobody in our family goes to a church. It was fine when they spoke whatever they spoke about me. I could take it because I was living my own love life in that, that point. I mean, I was in love with Jesus, the lover of my soul. Who cares what they said about me? But then they started saying things about my parents. 
and they weren't invited to places. My father's younger brother had this beautiful birthday bash for his 60th birthday, and my dad wasn't invited. It's his brother. They would go to places, and people would ask them, why are you here? You don't know how to raise your kids, and you want to come over here? A respected man in his community and his wife were no longer welcome, and that hurt. That hurt more than anything. And I, I remember the moment of sitting there in my bed just feeling the roots of bitterness starting to take hold inside. Why are you not doing anything about this? I chose you. I came to you. You said, you said, and something was not right. Wait, he saved me. He set me free. He's now my Lord and Savior, my Redeemer, my Deliverer. And yet I'm sitting here thinking these thoughts Look, look at this quote. This quote always gets me. Bitterness is believing God got it wrong. Worry is not believing God will get it right. And forgiveness is believing you're right even after God says you're wrong. And I spend a long time telling myself, no, they can't do this to me. They shouldn't do this to our family. Lord, you're the one who let me down. And all the while, the loving gentle, soft voice of the Holy Spirit on the inside saying, you're wrong, my dear. This is not my way. This is not the way of salvation. This is not the way of Jesus Christ. But I hung on for a while, the bitterness and the unforgiveness. I'll tell you why. Because there's benefits. If you didn't know, there are benefits to walking in unforgiveness. I'll tell you what some of them are. Holding somebody's wrong against them gives us power. It gave me power to hold it over their head. I could hold it over my community's head. And if anyone did anything, I could use it to thump them on the head to say, yeah, well, see. See what you did. It makes us feel righteous. It made me feel righteous. I wasn't using Jesus' righteousness to feel righteous. I was using their bad words and deeds against me to feel righteous. It made me feel superior. It made me feel mature. It gave me a sense of entitlement. Hey, do you know what she said? Do you know what he did? Do you know how they spoke to my dad? And all of a sudden, I could get away with something. You know why? Because they did worse. Mm. Their offense became my defense. When somebody said something against my family, I carried it around like a loaded gun. Because the moment someone else did something, pew! Hey, it gave me power. It gave me a sense of feeling like I was on, in control on top of it. Our right to feel angry puts us in God's position. I know it put me in God's position. I wanted to be judge and jury. How dare they treat us this way? But God, thank God, thank God for Jesus. That soft, still voice did not stop. Continue to speak to me and speak to me and speak to me till one day those chains broke. And boy, did they break. Because to this day, one of my favorite topics to speak on is forgiveness. Now, don't you want to know what true biblical forgiveness is? Well, I would like to tell you, but I'm not going to because I'm not qualified. But I know someone who is, and his name is Jesus. So why don't we open our Bibles? And let's go to Matthew 18. And I'm going to let our Lord tell you in the way that only he can what true biblical forgiveness is. And I want us to catch a glimpse because here's my heart's desire. Some of us have been struggling. We don't even talk about it. It's hidden deep inside and it causes a lot of pain when we try to talk about it. But you know what we're going to do today? We're going to uproot it. We're going to pull it out and then we're going to cast it so far away that it'll never come back, and we're going to walk free. We're going to walk free today. Matthew chapter 18. So here's a dialogue between Peter and Jesus. And so Peter is coming to Jesus, and he starts in verse 21. He says, Lord, how often shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? If this sounds weird, let me tell you, Amos it actually deals with this chapter. See, God in those days in the Old Testament would forgive Israel three times. And then after three times, he'd punish them. So you got three chances, three strikes, and then you're out. And then he'd punish them. So Peter, because he's so clever, doubles it. He's like, okay, not three. I'll, I'll, I'll do better. 
times two, six. And for good measure, I'll add one, seven. So he's like, okay, seven times, right? Seven times, and then, and then I get to just deck him one. And Jesus said, <laughs> no, I don't say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. What's he saying? This is an expression saying infinitely, infinitely. You don't have a timer on, on forgiving. You walk in it all the time. And then he says, look, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. So, hey, in the kingdom of heaven, this is what forgiveness looks like. What's it look like? Well, a certain king wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Settle accounts. He wanted to settle accounts. He wanted to balance it, okay? And when he had began to settle the accounts, what happened? There was one brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let's say that's like, I don't know, a million dollars, all right? 10,000 talents. But he was not able to pay, so the servant couldn't pay him. So the master commanded that he be sold, his wife and children and all that he had, and payment be made. Before anyone take offense to this, he was the king. He owned this servant, and therefore his wife and his children belong to the king. We're not talking about slavery here. We're not talking about whether this is right or wrong. We all know that no human being has that kind of power on you. Amen? Nobody. If we believe in the headship of the husband, but the wife voluntarily submits. We believe in the headship of the pastors, but the sheep voluntarily submit. Right? We believe in the headship of the leaders of this nation, but we as the citizens of this nation, voluntarily submit, right? We believe in the headship of our Lord Jesus, but we, as his disciples, voluntarily submit. We don't believe in slavery. But the king had every right to sell these, this family. But the servant fell down before him and said, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, and he released him, and he forgave him his debt. So think about this. He just wiped the slate clean. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So this is like a forgiven a million dollars. Here's a hundred dollars. Okay. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat. This is not nice. Okay. Saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not. The servant wouldn't do this for him. But he went and threw him in the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants, when the other servants saw this, they were grieved and they came and they told the king all that had been done. And then this king, after he had called him, said, you wicked servant. Not nice words. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him, look at this, to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Can he pay all that was due him if he's stuck in prison? No. So there's no way out. I need you to see this. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Whew. That's a heavy story. That makes me stop. And I did stop because God started dealing with me because he wanted to show me something. See, the king didn't have to release the servant, but he did. The king didn't have to wipe the servant's debt free, but he did. Mercy is not getting what you truly deserve. That servant deserved to be thrown in prison. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. He got a clean account. Go in peace. I'm not gonna, the king had compassion and sent him off. Wow, that doesn't sound fair. You're absolutely right. It's not fair at all. You want to know what else is not fair? The cross. See, here's my little illustration, and I need you to, to look and like get a hold of this. Here's our little balance, and we all live with one in our souls. And every time someone does something, we try to settle the account. Somebody else does something, we try to settle the account. Every once in a while, it's really bad. They hurt you really bad, and it's like this. And every part of you wants to retaliate to even the score, because we want this. We have a sense of fairness inside us, and we always want to do this. And the king wanted to do this. The king wanted to balance his account. It needs to look like this on both sides. But you know something? You know what Jesus did when he came? He said, forget about this. This is not what you want. This is what I'm going to do. He upset 
the scale to such a degree that the account remains unbalanced forever. You know what unfairness is? It's when something is not fair on your behalf. Let me tell you something. The cross is not fair on your behalf because all of us deserved only one final destination. The most unfair thing in history is what sets us free. How dare we try to balance the scale when Jesus came and tipped it upside down on our behalf. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Forgiveness is always going to tip the scale. And the account is always going to be unbalanced. Don't forgive and then wait to feel good. Because there's going to be a unsettling feeling on the inside. I feel like I just let them get away with it. No, you didn't. You just released them into God's hands. And you know something? <laughs> That's a scary place to be. But it's no longer in your hands. You tip the scale. So be it. My Lord tipped the scale. And thank God that king opted not to balance his accounts because the man got to go free. Wow, that's amazing. But you know what? If he got to go free, then the servant's heart should have been filled with something. Filled with what? Filled with gratitude. Oh my goodness. Do you know how much I owed? And just like that, it's gone. You should be overflowing with gratitude because here's the second thing I want to tell you. Forgiveness should govern your every reaction. Why? Because you're overflowing with gratitude. See, this was my problem. I had gone and received the Lord as my Savior, but I wasn't letting Him overflow, take over every part of me, feel saturated with His peace and His joy. Instead, I was keeping score. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And Jesus said, ah, 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 your eyes are on the wrong place. Because you see, you don't get to walk entirely in your salvation unless and until you appropriate everything that I purchased for you on the cross. You got to know that you know that you know that you have been forgiven. And part of me is screaming, I know you don't know what they did to me. They should be coming and begging me for forgiveness. They should come and fall at my feet. And Jesus said, let's talk about feet. You know, I washed them. And I washed yours. I washed 12 pairs of feet. Ten would leave me, one would deny me, and one would betray me, but I washed them. Wow, that brings me to his feet, because Lord, you washed me. I wasn't in that room that night, on the night of the Last Supper, but you washed me in your blood. You took this sinful, filthy person who doesn't deserve anything, and you washed me. And you didn't just leave me there. You, you put a robe around me, and you invited me, and you called me child, and you said, call me father, and you came into covenant with me. Oh, wow. Hallelujah, Jesus. You know something? You tipped the scale entirely and for eternity. Lord, I will tip the scale and leave it unbalanced. But more than that, I will let your forgiveness govern my reaction to everything that happens in my life because I am the recipient of something big, of something big. Hallelujah. But the servant couldn't do that. The servant went and grabbed his servant in a very unkind way. And the guy said the same thing. I don't know if you noticed. The words are exactly the same. Have patience with me and I will pay you all. But he wouldn't listen. And he threw him in prison. Wow. And the other servants knew that this was wrong and went and told the king. And the king got angry. Why did the king get angry? First of all, that's the right of every woman. No, I'm just joking. But why did the king get angry? Think about this for a second. What about this made the king so angry? Let me tell you what it was. 
He, the king, had just forgiven the servant a huge amount of money. For you not to turn around and acknowledge it and walk in gratitude for that is an insult to the king. You've just insulted what the king did. Wow. His action was understandable. The servant owed him $100. He didn't pay it. Okay. His action may even have been legal. I can throw you in prison, so I'm going to throw you in prison. Okay. But it was not appropriate. Not in light of the fact that the king had forgiven him so much. Hey, you and I have been forgiven much. Therefore, we choose to walk in gratitude and forgive. It's a choice. See, our emotions don't control us. I don't care if I don't feel like forgiving. I do it as an act of the will. I sit and I say, in Jesus' name, I let it go. And you know what? That's what God asked me to do one day. I was lying in my bed, and he very clearly told me in a way that only he can. He said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to reach out to every single one of those family members that supposedly hurt you, and you're just going to love them. And I remember sitting there going, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, because that does not. (laughs) But you know, I knew that that's what God wanted me to do. And I will never forget that very first awkward phone call. It was the worst thing ever. Because they didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I needed to be obedient. I mean, thank God for the Holy Spirit who becomes that little pebble in your shoe and continues to bother you and bother you and bother you till you get it right. We never talk or sing about that ministry of the Holy Spirit, but thank God for that, amen? Because, whew, he did it, and so I did it. I got on the phone, and the first conversation was very awkward. Hi, hi. Um, How are you? I'm fine. And then I didn't know what to say, so I finally said, listen, I need you to forgive me. And they were like, what? I said, I just need you to forgive me. I don't think I've been respectful to you. You're entitled to feel any way you want you may feel like I have hurt you and I've hurt our heritage and I've somehow disappointed the community. I'm sorry, that's not what I intended to do. I must follow my heart. I know the truth and I must now seek it and I must be after it. See, I met this Jesus and I know he is real and he has done something marvelous in my heart and I just need you to know that he loves you. Now, you don't ever have to speak to me again, but I just needed you to know that. And that was it. It was a hard phone call. But the second one got easier, and the third one was much easier. And by the time I was done, I was free. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know why? Because nothing, and I mean nothing in this world, truly, truly, truly frees the soul like forgiveness. Unforgiveness will always imprison you. And you don't even realize that the one that's suffering is not the one that did you wrong. It's you. It's you. It was me. That was so many years ago, almost two decades ago now. And some of those very family members who shunned us and wouldn't talk to us have now come seeking us out because there's something about you. You're always happy. You're always at peace. Now, some of them may or may not come to Jesus. I don't know. That's in his hands. But I do know what I got to do. I got to be his witness. And the way I be his witness is I walk in love. My only command is to love, love, love. Amen? Hallelujah. Look, there is absolutely nothing that you can do to balance the scale. God has tipped it. We got to just live with an unbalanced scale. And hey, one day when we get to heaven, it'll be balanced. Amen? That's okay. We can live with the unbalance here. And we got to know that if you have been truly forgiven, take a look at those feet and remind yourself, they were washed. Wow. My gosh, who are we that our Lord, our Savior would do this for us, that the King would die for us? Mm. Okay. You know what, Lord? I get it. I'm going to walk in gratitude. Forgiveness is no longer an option like those road signs. It's what I do. It's who I am. I am forgiven, and therefore I forgive. And I walk in it every single moment of my life. But you know something? 
I do it not for any kind of brownie points with God. I don't earn anything from God. Hey, you can do anything you want to do from now till, you, till the king comes to take us home. And I'll tell you, you could not earn his love. He loves you. There's not a thing you have to do to earn it. He loves you. We live right not to earn his love. We live right because we love him. It's a response. It's not something that we do to get something from him. You are truly forgiven. You are truly free. But it's up to you and it's up to me to walk in that freedom. That's our biggest witness. I want to close with this quick story. In India, um, at one time, there was a huge problem with the monkeys, the wild monkeys. They were everywhere. Everywhere, into everything. They'd find a way to get into the house. It was awful. And so these uh, hunters came up with the best way to trap a monkey because it's hard. They're smart. You can't, you can't trap them. So they, they came up with this way. They devised this monkey cage. It had bars really close together. And this is what they would do. They'd put a nice, ripe mango right in the center of that cage. And then they'd set it up in various places. You want to know what the monkey would do? The monkey would come. You can see the mango. You can smell the mango. How many love mangoes? All right. So the monkey would do what I would probably do. Reach its hand inside and grab a hold of the mango. And the moment it grabbed the mango, it's trapped. Now all it needs to do is to let go and it can walk free. But you know something? The monkeys never learned to do that. They would hold on to the mango. They can't even eat the mango. They can't do anything but, hey, I got the mango. So they would hold on to the mango till the hunter came and nabbed that monkey. So my last parting words to you this morning is don't be a monkey. <laughs> we need to recognize that the mango ain't worth it. We got to let it go. We got to let it go. Hallelujah. Close your eyes with me. Let's take a little journey. We got some soul cleansing to do this morning. Holy Spirit of God, you've revealed to us those dark areas inside that need to be brought to light. Things that people may have done when we were children. Words that were spoken over us. Angry words, hurtful words, actions that were done that wounded us deeply. Fathers that were not there for us. Mothers that were so busy they neglected us. People who mistreated us. Hands that touched us where no one should be touched. Holy Spirit, help. Lord, you know, you know what your people are going through, what they've carried for so long. They try so hard to live well in spite of it. But I know you want them to live well without it. Spirit of God, help us this morning. It's not worth it. We want them to pay. But Father, you paid it all for us. We want them to suffer. But oh Jesus, you suffered on the cross for us. We want them to fall at our feet and cry for forgiveness. But Father, you washed our feet when Jesus was in that room. And then you washed us all over again when you hung on that cross and your blood was shed for us. But you don't know how they mocked me, and you don't know what they said. Man, they spit in my face. Oh, Jesus, help us to remember how they mocked you, and how they slapped you, and how they punched you, and how they scourged you, and how they spit in your face. Lord, you took it all, you bore it all, for us. 
And when you hung on that cross, you tipped the scale. Lord, we stand before you totally forgiven. Not just of what we did yesterday and not just what we are doing perhaps this morning or, or this afternoon, but for the rest of our lives here on earth, we live under the umbrella of your forgiveness because of that shed blood. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, it moves us. It humbles us. Jesus, you did this for us. Help us, Lord, to in return live lives that are worthy of your sacrifice. Help us to live lives that overflow with kindness and love and compassion and forgiveness. Not because we feel it, but because we know that it's the truth by which we ought to walk. And when we do it, that truth will set us free, truly free. Help us, Lord, to let go of our mangoes today. Help us to shake loose our hands and help us to walk in victorious freedom, Lord, knowing that no enemy has anything on us. No man has that kind of power over us and that we are surrendered in obedience to what you asked us to do. Father, help your people surrender their hurts, their disappointments, their wounds, and their pain to you this morning. Lord Holy Spirit, right now I believe that you are bringing things to their minds and to their memories, names of people perhaps that they need to fix things with, situations that need to be reconciled, events that happened that just need to be put to bed. Lord, I pray for the grace of obedience in this place. I pray that these people will come forward and leave these things at your throne. Father, some, some people here are going to sleep so well tonight. They're going to sleep better than they've slept in a long, long time. Their heads are going to hit the pillow this, this evening and they're going to enjoy one of the sweetest, most peaceful and refreshing slumbers that they've ever had. You know why? Because they'll be walking in your freedom. Hallelujah. Lord, help us. Help us to do this for your honor and for your glory. Help us to do this so we are better witnesses of your kingdom. Help us to do this so we are like you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm feeling a prompting. So let's just obey the Holy Spirit. If you are here and you are struggling with something, some wound, some hurt from the past, then I urge you, before you leave today, come to the front, come to the altar symbolically and leave it. And walk free, absolutely free. Don't leave carrying that same thing that's been there for so long. Bring it here and let it go. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We give you glory. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. If you'd like me to pray with you, I will be in the front, but I'm going to urge you to come up and leave it. This is between you and God. Some of you may need to go make a phone call or two afterwards. That's fine. You do that. But no that you are going to walk in victory. Amen? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah.